Thank mm-hmm. you. 
Yeah. <laughs> 
or shortening the duration of people being linked faster. Um, we're meeting the goals of viral suppression. Um, but what's not great about is around the state, which is not true of the city data, is this is one area where the, we're not moving in the right direction of all of our metrics, is that we're seeing a lot of still concurrent AIDS diagnosis with HIV diagnosis in the state, but not in the city. So, um, you know, we're looking closely into that. We're seeing a de decrease in HIV-related deaths and um, a 41% increase in crepulization between 2016 and 2017. So, you know, think about 2018, it should be even higher. Um, so these are just general, general things. So check out the ETE dashboard. Yeah. You mentioned linkage of the group. Did they say anything about retention? You know, it, it wasn't in my notes. So. I'll look on the dashboard. Look on the dashboard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That, but I know that they really zeroed in on the, the, the number link and the timing of linkage and like a big increase in numbers that are being linked within 30 days. So that's good. Okay, um, in terms of our upcoming rounds, on January 10th, we have Brian Cutman <laughs> uh, talking about how stigma, stigma toward anal sexuality impedes engagement in HIV prevention practices among US men who have sex with men. And that will be a, a joint, uh, Presentation with um, Shunkil Wai. This is a person I don't know from the School of Public Health at Rutgers. Can you say anything about that there? Um, he does research in China. Okay. In Amazon. Taking the guess out of zero guessing, HIV self testing for MSM in China. So that'll be on January 10th. And I'm not going to give the rest of January. January, January 24th, we have Hannah Cooper from um, Emory University, vulnerability to HIV among people who use drugs in Kentucky, the rural risk environment. In February, we have Keith Shopkoff. Keith Shopkoff, um, the director of CHIPS at UCLA. will be here in February. Any other seminar announcements? Okay, on to today's event. Welcome, Jenna <laughs> Turin, we're so glad you're here. Um, Jenna is a professor in the Department of Health Care Organization and Policy at the University of Alabama. Birmingham School of Public Health. She's director of the UAB's Sparkman Center for Global Health and co-director of the Behavioral Community Science Corps of their CIFAR, which has been a great CIFAR. It's been really active for a long time. Um, she's a social and behavioral scientist with main research interest in areas of maternal and child health and HIV prevention in low resource settings for both developing and developed countries. She completed her doctoral training in population dynamics at Johns Hopkins University for postdoctoral post training at UCF, Center for AIDS Prevention Studies, CATS, or other sister centers, <laughs> <laughs> and was on the faculty at UCF four years before moving to UAB. And I think it's worth knowing that prior to that, <laughs> she received her MPH from Pop, Pop and Fam Health here at Public Health at Columbia. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and, I, and I also want to say that her CV reflects this, but I've also heard through recent years from a number of people and personal testimonies about how um, how active Janet is and how the engagement is extremely generous as a mentor. Um, I've just heard that from so many people and you can actually see that on her CV. And of, of fellows and early stage investigators, including one of our very own Andrea Jimmy Collins. So thank you for that, for doing that. Um, let me just say a little bit more about her current research, including qualitative, quantitative, mixed method studies designed to address HIV-related stigma, as well as intersectional stigma related to poverty, gender, race, ethnicity, and reproductive choices in settings as diverse as rural Kenya and the Deep South in the United States. And we all really need more research in the Deep South. I think all of us need to get engaged in that. She's principal investigator of several NIH-funded studies that examine effects, mechanisms of action, and intervention strategies for HIV-related stigma as they relate to utilization of MCH services, mother child services, prevention of mother child transmission, HIV medication adherence, and engagement in care. So, we're really pleased that you're here to talk with us today about intersectional stigma, HIV related health, challenges, and opportunities for assessment and programs. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, let's, you may or may not need this. Let, let's see. Um, is the, does the microphone work okay? It does working? Okay. <laughs> All right, great. Then and I if guess. Anyone, just raise your hand. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you. I, it's really a pleasure to be here, uh, it, and it's great to see uh, so many people that are interested in this topic. Um, as a yes, as a, Bob mentioned, I, I realized that I finished my MPH here 30 years ago in population and family health. So that <laughs> shows my age, I hate to say. But um, it's, it was a great, a great start to my career, which has gone on since then. So today I'm gonna, we're gonna talk about intersectional stigma, and, um, which I think is a really a new, an exciting area that a lot of people in the HIV field are now becoming aware of and getting really interested in. So I wanna share a little bit with you about what, what we've learned and what's going on in this area. So uh, I'm sure everyone in this room is, is aware of the National HIV AIDS uh, strategy that was updated for 2020. And in addition to a lot of other important guidance, um, this policy says that we are going to guarantee unfettered access to high quality life extending care free from stigma and discrimination. So that there's the call that we really need to focus on stigma and discrimination. Uh, I also probably don't need to explain too much to this crowd about what stigma means, but I always like to start with a little bit of a general background. Uh, so I think many people know that in terms of you know, the academic research field, stigma was really initially defined by the sociologist Irvin Goffman back in the 1960s. And I think that, that work still has some uh, relevance for, for today. But Goffman talked about attributes, identities, or behaviors that can cause individuals to lose social value. And he talked about something that was deeply discrediting and that reduced a person from being a whole and usual person to a tainted and discounted one. Now, of course, there's been, since then, there's been decades of, of research and conceptualizing and theorizing around stigma, which is great. And we know that some of the more modern conceptualizations of stigma you know, talk about stigma as a process and something that's very linked with power dynamics in society. So again, probably you all are familiar with Link and Phelan's stigma process, which talks about uh, how stigma happens when these following you know, interrelated components converge. So first, people label and distinguish and label human differences. Then dominant cultural beliefs in society link labeled persons to undesirable characteristics. So these are negative stereotypes. And then these labeled persons are placed in distinct categories to make like a separation of us from them. And finally, labeled persons experience status loss and discrimination that lead to unequal outcomes. And this is all, um, this is something that happens in all societies and communities around the world. There's also been a lot of work showing how stigma can affect health. Um, now, we know from a, a huge body of research that stigma adversely affects the quality of life and the physical and the mental health of people that are living with stigmatized conditions. Uh, we also know that stigma and fears and anticipations of stigma can make people like, less likely to practice preventive health behaviors or utilize health services that they need. And so this is what we call anticipated stigma often that keeps people away from services that they need. But we also know that stigma can lead to discrimination and even violence, which also has adverse consequences for health. So it's pretty clear that stigma is, is closely linked with health. Now, in, um, there, are a lot, there are a lot of different stigma frameworks and um, theoretical models. I think we like to talk about four basic dimensions of stigma. And so, as I mentioned, one really important dimension of stigma is this anticipated stigma. The fear that if people know about your condition, identity, attribute, that people will treat you badly because of that. And that can be very important for behaviors. There's also something that can be referred to as normative stigma or perceptions of community stigma. And that's just the perceptions that people have about how people are treated out in the community. How are people like me treated out in the community? And then there's what we call experienced or enacted stigma which is really 
actual acts of discrimination, so when people are actually treated differently because of their status. And finally, a really important dimension of stigma is internalized or self-stigma. And this is when people kind of take those attitudes, those negative attitudes and stereotypes that are out there in the community, and they apply them to themselves, internalize them, resulting in low self-worth, blame. And this has been shown to be really important for a lot of um, health behaviors and um, also linked to poor, poor mental health. So this is another one to really pay a lot of attention to. So here is a framework uh, that we've uh, worked on in our group to kind of understand the mechanisms and pathways for uh, how HIV-related stigma experienced on an individual level can affect the health outcomes. And this was really led by uh, Brunette Turan in the Department of Psychology uh, at UAB. So here you can just see that this, here we have HIV-related stigma on an individual level and this, the dimensions that I talked about. And we certainly recognize that these are influenced by one structural stigma, stigma out there in policies, services, uh, the greater society, but also by intersectional stigmas that we're going to talk about today, stigmas around race, class, gender, and sexuality. And so we have determine some sort of groups of mechanisms through which stigma often operates. And these include interpersonal factors, like stigma cause reduced social support and more social isolation. It also influences psychological resources, like self-efficacy. It also influences mental health, so depression, anxiety. And it also can contribute to stress and uh, that stress processes, chronic stress, may be experienced by people who live day in and day out with stigma. And so according to our framework, these mechanisms then work both to influence engagement in care, so people's ART adherence and retention in care, but in some cases, and especially when we talk about the stress processes, may directly impact HIV-related health in terms of when we look at viral loads or CD4 counts. And I would say in the studies that we've done over the past few years, we have found evidence for almost all of these pathways uh, that it, they're looking like they really do significantly influence these outcomes. Just one more word about stigma and stress, and this is the one that we're still trying to figure out and disentangle more than the others, but we, you know, a lot of people are thinking about how experiencing stigma in a chronic way, day in and day out, that may lead to chronic stress, which could directly affect these health parameters through other systems in the body. So working, you know, influencing these stress responsive biological systems. Okay, so that was sort of the general background on stigma. Now I'm going to get to the topic of the day, which is uh, it was really intersectional stigma. So um, here we're just we're thinking about what it means to live with multiple stigmatized identities. And so, for example, here you might think of poor women in marginalized ethnic or racial groups living with HIV. And in this case, so a woman could exper be experiencing stigma around her HIV status. She could be experiencing another level of stigma related to being pregnant and living with HIV. She might be experiencing stigma because she's in a racial or ethnic group that's stigmatized in her society. Or she, and she also could be experiencing stigma because she's poor. So um, this results often in multiple experiences of stigma and discrimination. So we've been sort of trying to think about this uh, quite a bit for the past uh, couple of years, and um, so and we um, we came to Fogarty, the Fogarty Center of NIH, brought together a group of uh, researchers working on stigma. I think it was a couple of years now, now or maybe a year and a half ago, and um, we were a group of us were charged to try to write a paper and think about intersectional stigma. So this, um, it's kind of 
know why that got squeezed up there. But this, a lot of this, what I'm going to present, are, are going to be in this forthcoming paper, which is going to be coming out in BMC Medicine next month. So we talk, in this paper, we're talking about intersectional stigma as a construct that characterizes the convergence of multiple stigmatized identities within a person or group and tries to understand and address their effects. And this really allows us to think a little bit more holistically as people, as, as whole people, about how living with all these different identities affects people's behaviors, as well as individual and population health outcomes. Another uh, aspect of the field of, of intersectional stigma and intersectionality is that we also try to think about protective factors. So what happens when people living with multiple stigmatized identities come together and unite? And what are the factors like social support, resistance, and adaptive coping that can happen through those sort of interactions? In terms of the background, I mean, intersectionality is not a theory. It's a framework. Uh, it's a way for understanding these things. And it really goes back quite far, as far back as a Sojourner Truth in the 1800s, who talked about the experiences of being a black woman in a society that devalued both female gender and minor minority racial status. So it goes way back. Um, the term intersectionality is largely attributed to Crenshaw's 1989 work. Um, so when she wrote about demarginalizing the intersection of race and sex, a black feminist critique of anti-discrimination doctrine, feminist theory, and anti-racist politics. That's a mouthful. But, <laughs> but again, so people have been thinking about this in sociology, in economics, in different fields for quite a while. Um, I think the kind of interest in the field of HIV and in the field of stigma is, is a little bit more recent. So when we're talking about intersectional stigma, we can think of a variety of different stigmas that can intersect on multiple levels. And this is a, a bit parallel to Goffman's categories, if people are familiar with those. But so one, we can talk about intersectional stigma from one or more coexisting physical ailments or health conditions. So someone may be living with the stigma of HIV, but they also have mental health disorder and are dealing with that at the same time. Or they have stigma around TB as well as stigma around cancer, for example. So they're just, people may be living with multiple health conditions that are stigmatized. But we also are thinking about affiliations with marginalized groups in society. So stigma around your race or your ethnic identity or your sexual orientation or your gender. So those can also intersect with these other stigmas. We're also uh, thinking about factors that are attributed to behaviors or ones that in, in many societies might be, be associated with people's moral character. I mean, I'm, again, I'm going back to Goffman a little bit. But so behaviors like smoking, alcohol use, substance use, sex work, incarceration, any of these behaviors that are stigmatized in society could uh, intersect with any of these other stigmas. So you can see it gets pretty complicated. <laughs> this is not a, not a simple kind of thing to try to disentangle. So just a very brief summary of some of the literature on intersectional stigma that's, you know, that's come out. So there are studies, of course, using vignettes where they, and they have found that public attitudes toward people change depending on the constellation of stigmatized identities that they have. So for example, you know, people presented with vignettes of in, individuals with HIV would uh, report greater social distancing from those people if you add injection drug use or gay identity to that individual. So the more of these kind of stigmatized attributes or identities people have, the more people want to distance themselves. When research that's been done with individuals who are living with more than one stigmatized identity, in many cases, people do report exacerbated experiences of stigma. But actually, some studies have found that more than one stigmatized characteristic may even mitigate the stigma related to another characteristic. And this is actually in the 
found in multiple studies, just one example here, but in one study that um, was done in Birmingham, we found that people living with HIV who experienced higher levels of discrimination around their sexual orientation reported lower levels of HIV-related stigma. So that's just another complexity to think about. And although, you know, relatively limited at this point, some research is starting to show that intersectional stigma is associated with worse HIV-related behaviors and outcomes, such as dis decreased disclosure, lower linkage and retention in HIV care, suboptimal ART adherence, depression. There's a lot of work going on around PrEP, PrEP these diet days, and trying to think about how intersectional stigma affects PrEP uptake. So I'm gonna talk briefly about options for measuring intersectional stigma. And it's a, you know, again, it's a relatively new area. We can't <laughs> say that there's one way that's best to measure it or assess it. I think at this point, we need to use all the tools that we have available and really try to figure out things as much as we can. But basically, you know, you know, research can be done on this topic using qualitative, quantitative, and even better mixed methods research that takes advantage of both. Um, when we think about quantitative measurement options, uh, there are a lot of different ways that you could get at this. So one option is you could measure stigma related to one identity or health condition. Say you're gonna measure HIV-related stigma, for example. Then you can examine how that experience differs among different groups that may be you know, stigmatized in society. So you could look how HIV-related stigma differs among you know, blacks versus whites, versus uh, you know, straight versus gay, um, different, you know, different men versus women. So that's just one sort of, in a way, more simple way to look at intersexual stigma. Because then you sort of assume that they're feeling stigma around that identity, right? Another way that people do it is they ask parallel questions on stigma and discrimination related to different identities. So I don't know if people have heard of the, you know about the everyday discrimination scale, right? So that's, you know, an example. It asks, for example, you know, in your daily life, how often do you experience the following? And then it might say, for example, um, I'm treated with re less respect than other people. And they rate, you know, the frequency, but then they also say, you can ask that because of your HIV status, because of your gender, because of your economic situation. So you ask basically the exact same questions for different uh, stigmatized identities. Another option, and this is one that we're using in a study that we're gonna be presenting uh, today, is that you can measure each stigma separately and individually using validated, nuanced, specific scales for that thing. So you can measure uh, racism with validated scales of racism. You can measure poverty stigma or substance use stigma with specific scales and then use uh, sort of uh, complicated uh, analytical techniques to try to yeah. compare those. Yes? In, in terms of your model, when, when you say racism and these other examples, where does it fit in your model? What kind of stigma are we talking about when we look at these four? So I guess we're we're considering, you know, any. Um, so race is, I mean, it is a. We consider it a, a kind of a stigma. Racism is a kind of stigma, and when it gets to enacted racism, then you know that discrimination. So we're considering it, you know, one of the intersectional stigmas up there in our model. But it, we we use sort of some standard some scales of racism that people have have already developed. Um, another option is that some people have gone down is to measure, to create measures of unique experiences of intersectional stigma within a specific group. For example, developing a scale of gendered racism experienced by Latinas, for example, very, very, very specific. So to go with these different possible ways that you can measure these intersectional stigmas, there are also different analytical approaches, right? 
So you can use moderation approaches where you would do interaction terms for stigma-related variables and see the extent to which they interact in predicting outcomes. Um, you can do uh, multi-level modeling where you might have both individual level and community level variables for multiple stigmas. You could do structural equation modeling, uh, and that would allow you to really look at complex uh, pathways and relationships among different types of stigma. And another method that, uh, is, uh, that I'm going to show you again more examples of is uh, latent variable, latent class, and latent profile methods. And so here, this allows you to examine subgroups that have different profiles or patterns of these different stigma, stigma associated with different characteristics. So I'm going to give more detailed example on that in a bit. So I want to tell you a little bit about a study that we've been conducting over the past uh, few years, which is the uh, women's, <laughs> I can't see, women's adherence and visit engagement study, or we call WAVE, which is a study uh, funded by NIMH. And in this study, we are studying the mechanisms and the longitudinal effects of stigma on women's adherence and outcomes in the National Women's Interagency HIV Study, or the WISE. And for people that are, if people are not familiar with the WISE, this is a cohort, uh, a large cohort of women living with HIV and uh, demographically matched, non-HIV infected uh, women who are at risk of HIV. It has been going on since 1994. Uh, but we at UAB were, uh, we jo joined the study in 2013 when uh, WISE added four sites in the U.S. South. And so at 2013, we added, we're, we're a joint site with Birmingham and Jackson, Mississippi. But we also have, there's a site in Miami, Atlanta, and Chapel Hill. So these sites have just joined the cohort recently and an opportunity for us to study a lot of the things that are going on in the South. So I'm not going to talk about the entire study, but I did want to talk about our, our third aim of the study, which is, is a, about intersectional stigma. So in this aim, we're, we want to examine the link between intersectional stigma, and in this case, we were looking at stigmas around HIV, race, ethnicity, poverty, and gender. And how those were associated with H adherence to HIV treatment recommendations. And we're, we are using mixed methods research, so we're able to use the advantages of both qualitative and quantitative research. So we have conducted qualitative in-depth interviews with women living with HIV, and then questionnaires, and again, we used uh, existing validated measures of HIV-related stigma, racism, sexism, and poverty stigma. And so first I'm going to talk a little bit about the qualitative work. And this was led by Dr. Whitney Rice, who, uh, who you see here, who was a doctoral student with us at UAB in public health and is now an assistant professor at Emory. And so she was really the one. And she's recently published this in, um, in Social Science and Medicine. So um, the WAVE collects some data across the entire cohort, but we collect more detailed data in um, some specific sites. So our sub-study sites, we did interviews in Birmingham, Jackson, San Francisco, and Atlanta. And we did some kind of purposive quota sampling to get a variety of ethnic racial groups, ethnic groups, some variation in income and sexuality, and the age here, you can see this is because uh, the WISE cohort is a, a, an aging cohort of women living with HIV. As it started back in the, in the 90s, it's, um, we don't have a lot of the younger women. And so here are just some of, the, uh, some of the qualitative findings. So we did find that these women experienced a lot of intersectional stigma related to their different identities. And so here you can see, this is a typical quote that just shows you how difficult it is to disentangle intersectional stigma. So all my life, I've always wondered what people discriminated against me for. Is it because I was black? 
Is it because I was biracial? I never knew if people were discriminating against me because I was HIV positive, because I was a woman. Honestly, I don't know what. I can't like really pinpoint. I just know that something, I guess it is a gut feeling. Something just didn't feel right. Like somebody insulted me and like later I'm like, what was that for? So <laughs> in addition to talking a lot about HIV related stigma, these women talked about a lot about stigma around being a woman, stigma around being their race, uh, stigma around being poor. Um, I would add that race was not only just about uh, stigma about their own race, but also around being in mixed race relationships, which I thought was interesting. But also talk, women talked about stigma around incarceration, their age, and their weight. So there was, there was a lot going on there. And so here are just some of the quotes uh, that can show you some of these intersections. So this talks about sexism, sex work, stigma, and HIV. The men can do what they do, and the women shut their mouths and take it. Women can't do anything about it. That's the whole culture. They downgrade a lot of us women who are prostitutes. They are street girls, so HIV is what they get. Or here's another one that talks about racism, sexism, and HIV. Yes, stigma affects me personally, because I'm a woman that's living with HIV, and I'm a black woman, too. So I'm just kind of I'm calling out these things, a woman and then a black woman, because these are things that have been stigmatized the worst. And then poverty stigma uh, came out a lot too. So people just talk down on the poor women. And to the rich ones, people are just sorry that it happened, and then people are off to another topic. The poor ones, people are just constantly beating them up. Poor women already feel bad about their HIV status, but they constantly just are being reminded of it. It is a battle. So these were you know, pretty strong, strong stories. Um, we also, as I mentioned, are measuring poverty stigma quantitatively. And we have a, a paper that's uh, revise and resubmit that's going to be coming out, I hope soon, showing among women living with HIV, poverty stigma actually has really strong associations with viral load, um, adherence, uh, CD4, all the outcomes that we generally look at. Uh, so that was, uh, that was interesting for us and I think important to think about. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the latent class analysis. And uh, this work has been led by Dr. Andrea Norsini Pala and uh, Dr. Brent Turan from uh, UAB Psychology. So um, I, I hope I do justice in my explanations. And if we have questions, <laughs> we know who to ask. He's right here. So again, here we wanted to use a person-centered approach that so we, and this assumes that stigmas are associated with each other in different ways for different individuals. And these heterogeneous groups of individuals differ in their outcomes. And we know, again, that people have multiple social identities. And so they may experience stigma and discrimination differentially in terms of both the types of stigma that they experienced and, and the levels. So latent class analysis or latent profile analysis these allow us to identify subgroups, in this case, women of women who have different patterns of stigma due to HIV, race, SES, and, and gender. And so then after figuring out these profile groups, then we're able to look at how ART adherence and other outcomes vary across the groups. And we're also going to look at how women's characteristics interact with these latent profiles. OK. <laughs> so. Here, um, this is a, you know, from our sample of the subsample from the Ys. These are all women living with HIV. Uh, these are sort of how the profiles uh, fell out. And here, just to see the key, the, the reddish is financial or poverty stigma. The, the green, the second one, is gender-related stigma or sexism. Uh, the blue is HIV-related stigma. And the pinkish is, uh, is racial stigma or racism. So in the analyses that Andrea has conducted, you know, and using, again, these different unique validated measures, which then he was able to standardize using item response theory, correct? 
And you can see here also that, so here's zero. So the ones, these are all standardized so that if it's above this line, it means higher levels of stigma. And if it's below this line, it's, it's lower. So basically, these are the profiles that they have, have come out according to these analyses. So there's a group here who has low levels of discrimination on all four. So all four are under the line, right? And then we have a group here who has high levels of discrimination on all four. And then we have another profile, a group here that has high financial, gender, and HIV discrimination and some racial discrimination. And then another profile of people who have some financial and HIV discrimination, but are low on gender and race. And finally, another profile that have some gender, racial, and financial discrimination, and but very low levels of HIV-related discrimination. And so these, um, Andrea, right, these are all enacted stigma subscales, right? Because we had enacted stigma for, for all of these four. So in the analyses, it, uh, these are again, these are preliminary results, but it looks like these different profiles are, some of them are significantly associated with, with different in outcomes that we all care about. So in, in all these analyses, the reference group is the, the profile three, the ones that are low. So here you can see that this group has lower odds of undetectable viral load, optimal ART adherence and HIV visits. This group was mainly associated with ART adherence, um, a lower level of, lower likelihood of optimal adherence. I don't know if that's influenced by the small N in that group, perhaps. Um, but again, this profile also interested in, associated with reduced odds of undetectable viral load, optimal adherence, and HIV visits. Some of these profiles were also significantly associated with uh, worse health outcomes in terms of CD4 and CD4, CD8 percentages. And also these profiles were associated with higher uh, depressive symptoms and higher odds of drug use. So, I mean, we'll, we'll love to discuss all this with you. I think there are a lot of um, trying to understand all this is, you know, takes some, some careful thinking, but I think we are seeing that intersectionality influences these outcomes in significant ways. So we can talk more about that later, but I just want to, you know, one, acknowledge this is a, a big group involved in this WAVE study with, uh, of course, we acknowledge always the, the participants, the women, and but also these groups from, from different universities who are involved in this study and, of course, our funders. So now I'm going to highlight some other work on intersectional stigma, which is uh, led by another person in this room, Dr. Christy Stringer. Uh, so uh, again, Christy was a doctoral student in medical sociology working with me at UAB. And her dissertation focused on the intersection of HIV-related stigma and substance use stigma. And she, collect, she conducted the eCharm study in Birmingham. So she did a mixed method study. Uh, she did quantitative surveys with people living with HIV who were also current drug users. She also did focus groups with people from that same population. And she, these were all recruited for people who at least at some point had been engaged with the 1917 HIV clinic at, at UAB. And so she examined the impact of HIV-related stigma and drug use stigma on ART adherence and retention in care in this population. And so she had some pretty interesting findings, I thought. She, um, in the quantitative analysis, you know, interestingly, in this population, HIV related stigma did not predict retention and care and ART adherence. And that's quite different from what we see sort of in general populations of people living with HIV. HIV stigma is usually a significant predictor of worse adherence and worse outcomes. In the quantitative, that did not come out. What did come out is that anticipated stigma on drug use predicted adherence to ART significantly. And this was true even when controlling for HIV-related stigma. 
So in this, at least according to these analyses, the drug-related stigma, very salient. In terms of her qualitative findings, um, I mean, people in the groups, they did talk about how they perceived that HIV-related stigma affected their adherence and retention in care in terms of them having to hide their medications from different people, avoiding being seen at the clinic. But they also talked a lot about the drug use stigma and in particular about how that affected patient, their interactions with healthcare providers. And this, um, I think this is, was quite important for us because we often feel like HIV clinics are very open, non-stigmatizing environments, but maybe not for everyone and maybe not people with all identities. So these people talked about stigma around drug use that they experienced both in HIV specialty settings and outside with other types of providers. And they talked about how that stigma limited communication and resulted in them getting suboptimal care. And here are just a few of the quotes that kind of bring this out. These are, again, from people living with HIV that are using drugs. So the first one. But you've got some people that ain't never know nobody on drugs. They might treat you a little differently, you know. Turn their nose up in the air. Go on and put some gloves on and everything just because you're on dope, you know. Or here's another one. Yeah, and that doctor-patient oath don't mean nothing because I see some doctors just talk so crazy to addicts, having them sitting there crying. They have an attitude. They don't want you. They already assume. Suspicious, suspicious. And when you get older, I'm in my 50s. And when you get older, aches and pains. And then they use that as an excuse. And they say that they use your past drug addiction as a way of not treating the problem. And you have to deal with it. And it's bad, especially when you are really in pain and they don't want to do nothing for you. And finally, one more. Uh, even from the people you mentioned, the social and the healthcare workers, they treat you like you're a failure. They don't want to be bothered. They try to get away from you, and, and you become a social pariah. Nobody wants to deal with whatever you've got going on. The other one is they pity you, and who wants to be pitied? Even the ones who want to help or just not, they shoo you away or get away from you. So these are the kind of things that people were, were talking about. So I think this is really important for us to consider. So I'm going to switch uh, gears a little bit and talk about interventions that are being developed to try to address intersectional stigma, and in particular in healthcare settings, um, because that's a big, a big focus for stigma reduction. Healthcare settings are where people are coming to get help, to get support, and if people experience stigma or discrimination in those settings, it can be really, really damaging. So. Some of the, there are interventions out there that are being, have been tested or being developed or being tested now. Um, some of these interventions work directly with healthcare providers to try to, you know, reduce their stigmatizing attitudes and behaviors. And those are some, those interventions are with medical and nursing students. Sometimes they're with current service providers. Some stigma reduction interventions try to work with all staff in a health facility. So, you know, not only the nurses and the doctors, but also the receptionists and the data clerks and the drivers and everybody. And these take forms of in-person workshops, uh, seminars, videos that people can watch or interactive apps on tablets or some of the newer ones that are being developed. There are also stigma reduction interventions that work with clients, and often these do, you know, do deal with different intersectional identities that people have. So there are stigma reduction interventions with African American women, with black MSM, transgender groups, and some that are just general for all people living with HIV. And then there are a few interventions, sort of multi-level interventions that work with both health workers and clients. And there was a multi-country African study that sort of piloted that approach, and we've been piloting an adaptation for that in the US uh, called Fresh, which I'm gonna talk about a bit. Oops, what did I do? There we go. So uh, Fresh, uh, which stands for Finding Respect and Ending Stigma Around HIV, uh, when, after I came, moved to the South in 2011, I, I thought, 
you know, we really need to learn more what's going on in the South. As you mentioned, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of work to do. I mean, with the history of racism, the poverty, the homophobia, I mean, you name it, the South is just a perfect storm of, of things that we need to intervene on regarding stigma. So we started out by doing some research with at-risk populations, with healthcare providers, including providers in primary care settings and at uh, health departments, and with people living with HIV. And our goal was to adapt this intervention that had been developed in Africa, uh, and uh, which was, was meant to reduce stigma and discrimination in healthcare settings, but adapt it for the South. And uh, Christy Stringer was also very much involved in this project. So the intervention has kind of three components. Um, the first component has to do with sharing information. So we collected all those local data about stigma in our own communities, in our own facilities, and we present that back to people that attend these workshops that, so they see what's going on here. We also give them general data about how stigma impacts the life of people living with HIV. An important part of this intervention is increasing contact with the affected group. So this is an intervention based on contact theory. We bring together healthcare workers and people living with HIV in a joint stick, uh, workshop situation. They work together. Um, and that has a lot of power just in itself. And we all, it also has an aspect of empowerment in that the clients who participate in these workshops, they get involved in activity to actually address and challenge and fight stigma, not just trying to cope with it or deal with it or whatever. So um, I think that has a powerful impact as well. So the workshop as we have piloted, is a, it's a group intervention workshop where we include around 10 health workers and again, we include all levels of health workers, nurses, social workers, physicians, receptionists, uh, whoever you know has contact with clients. Then we also include uh, 10 community participants, and these are all people living with HIV who are, of course, willing to participate in such a workshop. It's co-facilitated by a health worker and a client, one person living with HIV, and we've done it the way we have, the format we have now, it lasts one and a half days, it's sort of one full day and one half day, which we've done on weekends and in the neutral location, not, not at the health facility, but somewhere else. The things that we cover in the workshop include just talking a lot about trying to understand stigma. So looking at both what are the root causes of stigma and what are some of the consequences. Uh, we also talk a lot about intersectional stigma and intersecting stigmas. Uh, and we, have, we actually have an exercise which is very powerful where we pair a health worker and a client together and they talk to each other and tell each other stories about something that they have felt stigmatized or discriminated against in their lives. And everybody has something, you know, it's like, is it because you know, you're from Indiana, is it because you're not a Christian? Is it, you know, I don't know. There's, there, everyone has something that they can share, or even if it's not their personal experience, maybe it's someone they know. And so that is really, really powerful because the health workers and the clients start to see that we all live with these things. We talk about the outcomes of stigma. We usually do an HIV knowledge update because that unless is usually appreciated both by the clients and providers. Um, we have exercise on how to challenge or cope with stigma. And then we get them together in small groups of health workers and clients to actually plan stigma reduction activities for their own community and facility. So this is a pretty uh, a low tech uh, workshop. <laughs> Maybe we need to join the 21st century, I don't know, but we're, it's, it's, it's in person, it's hands-on. <laughs> Christy made these trees, <laughs> she worked hard on them. And so it's, uh, but it's really a, a lot of, uh, very enjoyable, I think, for the people, intense in some, you know, obviously we're talking about some very intense stuff, but, and so we did pilot this twice in Birmingham. Um, we found very high 
acceptability and feasibility of the workshop. Um, we found that people really found it engaging and dealing with real and prevalent issues in their lives. These were small pilots, you know, very small numbers, but we did from our pre and post comparisons, we found one increased awareness of stigma in the healthcare facility by the health workers, which is the first step just to re even realize that it's happening. And we did see decreased uncertainty about HIV treatment in the clients who participated. So we do have this pilot published uh, in a manuscript. So we're continuing our work on this uh, intervention right now. We are collecting baseline data from clients at providers at six HIV clinics across Alabama and Tennessee. And Dr. Scott Beatty is uh, leading that with funding from CIFAR. And so we're trying to further adapt and test the intervention so that we can do a larger trial, but we really want to make sure it's uh, user-friendly, relevant, something that, that can be implemented on a larger scale. We're also proposing to adapt it for some further international settings like the Dominican Republic. And if people are interested, even though these are preliminary and being updated, we do have the materials online at the uh, Alabama Mississippi Public Health Training, Training Center. And again, this is a huge uh, project that involved both, you know, the Alabama uh, Department of Public Health and the Jefferson County uh, Department of Health and a lot of different organizations across the state um, and a lot of team members, UIB and, and elsewhere. So we're, we're excited to take this further and, and just think about really how we can really try to address intersectional stigma through these and other, other modalities. So basically, um, in this uh, are all our goals to get to zero. I hope that we can sort of incorporate this idea of addressing intersectional stigma into this idea. So when we talk about, you know, zero discrimination, we're not talking about just zero discrimination around HIV. We're talking about the other identities that people also have and experience stigma. So I think. That is it. <laughs>